Oh my god, oh my god, the episode started and I don't ah. have an introduction. Dave, Dave, what do I do? How do I introduce the episode? Oh no. What is the show? Robert. What are we doing? It's, oh god, it's behind, you're behind something. The, 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 uh, the music? Yeah. This is Behind the Music, a show where we tell you everything you don't know about the greatest pop hits of the 1990s. Mm. Dave, uh, this is part nine of our series on All Star, the hit Smash Mouth song. Ooh. Uh, now, what do you think they meant with the line, get your game on, go play? Well, I think it could mean a lot of things, Robert. <laughs> Sophie almost threw Pop-Tarts at me there. <laughs> I'm Robert Evans. This is Behind the Bastards, of course, the show where we tell you everything you don't know about the very worst people in all of history. I am, uh, I've am i switched out my bubbly for a Dr. Zevia. Much I, better drink. Can I get a little... Yeah. yeah. Okay. Do you want me to pour it? Yeah, oh, pour over, it the, over, over the expensive the equipment again. recording equipment into your LaCroix. Into my... Oh, <laughs> hold on! I got a sweater. <laughs> yep. I can I can sop it up. Mop, mop that up with your sweater, Dave. Oh. This is so trash. This is great. <laughs> this is, I think we're okay. We're fine. It wasn't <gasps> on. <laughs> Almost spilled my drink cleaning that up. We're okay. It's all right. <laughs> we're doing great. I don't know why people put us in a room together. <laughs> Sophie's really close to throwing those pop darts. Great podcast content. Mm. I'm gonna, and great I, LaCroix. I, I, the people in their cars really enjoy that. Daniel, our, our audio engineer, is uh, not livid. <laughs> <laughs> this is the fourth set of thumbs up he's given us, which yes. is a good sign. We're on the right track. Sophie's punching her fist. <laughs> I guess let's talk about the dictator of Turkmenistan yeah, let's some more. Do it. <laughs> let's, let's, let's get back into it. So as you might guess, 9-11 was a very dangerous time to be both a New Yorker and an ostensibly Muslim dictator in a country anywhere near Afghanistan. Mm. Neither of those were safe things to be uh, yes. on 9-11. So uh, Niazov made what was in retrospect the major mistake in the 1990s of engaging in substantial trade deals with the Taliban, mainly so he could run pipelines through their country. Uh, as soon as the towers fell, Turkmenbashi reversed his stance on the Taliban and agreed to let the Pentagon use his country as a gigantic airstrip to prepare for the invasion of Afghanistan. Oh. Smart move. Yeah. Now, I haven't kept up on the invasion of Afghanistan since the early 2000s, but I assume it went well. Yeah, um, I, th I think, that I think all worked it out. wrapped up in a yeah. few months. Yeah, it seems like the kind of thing that would get, get handled pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. yeah. They didn't get out. Yeah, yeah. I, you know what I love about our wars is the defined endpoints. Yeah, oh, that's yeah. the best part about how we do war in America. Oh, absolutely! We're so good at endpoints. We're efficient. Yeah, we're like uh, we're like lost the TV show of countries. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Just a couple yeah. couple seasons <laughs> just, and you're done. Just a couple seasons and you're done. Yeah. Tell a quick, concise story. Yep. Now, helping America bomb a neutral country has always been a lucrative endeavor for the dictators who let us do it. Uh, Turkmen Bashi benefited mightily for his help. During Clinton's time, Turkmenistan had barely rated $600,000 a year in military aid. By 2003, after giving the U.S. access to Turkmen airspace and some land rights, that aid topped $19.2 million. Ooh. Yeah, it's like a 30-something times increase. So, smart decision, letting us bomb other people from your country right oh, yeah. after 9-11. It's, it's an easy fix. It's an easy fix. Yeah. <laughs> now, President Bush was happy to offer this dictator a security alliance, which Niazov used to crush what little resistance remained to his reign. There really wasn't much, though, and when Turkmenbashi finally saw major unrest, it would come in the form of one of his highest officials, Boris Shikmuradov, at that time the Turkmen ambassador to China, which is a really important job in Turkmenistan because China's kind of like your your big trading partner sure, in that area yeah. like you pretty pretty important to be in good terms with china so this guy is a high up official nice. uh, his nightmare came to life when his ambassador to china boris shikmuradov resigned and began denouncing his regime he claimed that turkmenbashi had ordered dissidents tortured and executed that he'd rigged elections and that he'd embezzled billions of dollars in government funds to his personal bank account now uh, Turkmen, yeah, he's not wrong. He's yeah. not wrong. Yeah, and Turkmen Bashi uh, responded by accusing Boris of embezzling tens of millions of dollars, which is also probably not wrong. Yeah, yeah, probably both embezzling. Oh yeah, this is just <laughs> everything's blowing up now, and yeah. everybody's pointing fingers. It's like that GIF of Spider Man pointing at Spider Man. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's what's happening here. Uh, now Shikmuradov uh, went to Europe and became the international symbol of resistance to Niazov's reign. Nothing happened for a while, and no resistance rose up from inside the country. But Shikmuradov was sort of a thorn in his side, like always going around, you know, the world talking about how terrible things were in Turkmenistan and trying to get people, you know, this is the period where the U.S. is overthrowing a couple of dictators. So he's trying to be like, overthrow this guy. Maybe put me in charge. Overthrow this guy. Right. He's one of those people. Okay. Seems like it. Uh, he may have been. And again, this. Yeah. It just goes back to the there's corruption. Yeah. To, I'll, I'll do it. And I'll it's fix like, the corruption. God, yeah. <laughs> 
No, don't don't have anyone ever be in charge of anything because people are bad at being in charge of countries. Yes. Have people be in charge of like it makes sense for a person to be in charge of a power plant. Mm-hmm. It makes sense for people to be in charge of a factory or when there's of like a one, restaurant. One goal. Yeah. <laughs> um, Gosh, people shouldn't be in charge of something like a country. It no. never works out. Yeah. It's it's bad a hundred percent of the time. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I this sorry, my radical politics infecting this history <laughs> no, podcast. Burn it all oh, down. Burn it all down. Da- burn no, just burn all the leaders down. Sure. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, yeah. Burn the leaders down. Use the ashes of their bodies to grow potatoes. Oh. Yeah. That's delightful. I feel like if there's one thing we need more of, it's potatoes. It would be like you could sell a brand, Dictators. That's a, <gasps> oh, my God, yeah. Dave. You nailed it. I know I did. <laughs> <laughs> I felt that one coming from my gut. It would be perfect. It's one of those jokes that like shifts the firmament of the universe. <laughs> it's, it's so appropriate. Oh, boy. I, I, that tickles me. <laughs> oh, we got to go into business. We got to go into business. I wonder where they buried Saddam. <laughs> Ooh, I mean, we could find out. We could And find if we out. don't, we could lie and say we did. Exactly, because who's going to know? Yeah. Exactly. Perfect. Oh, man. I even know some people we could bribe in that part mm. of them. Anyway, once Turkmen Bashi had kind of put the kibosh on this, uh, essentially accused this guy who had you know risen up against him of being corrupt, he sort of figured that was that was it for a while. Uh, And he went back to his favorite pastime of being a lunatic. Uh, In August of 2002, at the annual session of the People's Council, Turkmen Bashi announced that he was renaming all of the months. (laughs) I mean, why not? At this point, why why not? not? Why not rename the months? Yeah, fuck it. January was renamed. Can you guess what he called, he named January? (sighs) I assume after himself. Yeah, you got it. Yeah. January was Turkmen Bashi. February was Flag. April was named after his mother. Okay. Apparently because the month April signifies growth, and May was named after his favorite poet. Now, as a fellow writer, Dave, you know how creative flow works. Once you're really focused and you're putting out good work, you, you don't want to stop sometimes. You know, no. even if you, like, finish the project, you just start something else because you're like, well, I'm never, I'm, you know, you, you're it's rare to get in this headspace. Oh, you, yeah. You really want to take advantage of it. And I think Turkmen Bashi got caught up in that headspace a little bit because right after renaming all the months, he decided to rename all the days of the week. Sure. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> yeah you got to keep that going. You might as well. Yeah. Now, Monday was renamed Beginning Day. Tuesday was Young Day. <sighs> Should have been Fun Day. Should have been Fun Day. Mm. Uh, Wednesday was Good Day. Thursday was Blessed Day. Friday was Mother Day. Saturday and Sunday were Soul and Recovery Day, respectively. Recovery Day makes sense. Recovery Day would make sense. <laughs> Especially since Saturday, Soul Day, was also the day that everyone in the country was supposed to read his book. Ooh. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So you really need some recovery after that. <laughs> Now, after no debate, the Parliament and the People's Council ratified all these changes to the names of the days and months. Uh, this basic method, Turkmen Bashi making a declaration and then changing suddenly huge aspects of daily life in an instant, happened with increasing regularity in the early 2000s. Hmm. When Turkmen Bashi learned that the traffic police were extorting bribes from motorists, he fired them all and replaced them with army recruits. Sure. <laughs> sure. That's going to that's going to work that's out, gonna right? That's fine. Bunch of new <laughs> new guys with guns directing traffic directing with traffic. no training. How I don't could see it, how that could fail. Yeah, I don't see how that could work out badly. <laughs> he also continued to shower Turkmenistan with the blessings of his wisdom. Here's the book Inside Central Asia. Inspired by what he believed to be a semi-divine revelation, he decreed that the life of a Turkmen consisted of nine stages of 12 years each, starting with childhood and progressing through adolescence, youth, maturity, what he called the prophetic stage, and then from age 61 to 62, the inspirational stage, which just happened to be his age at the time. Wisdom and old age followed, ending with the Oguz Khan stage at age 109. Oguz Khan was the legendary founder of the Turkmen nation, like their Romulus. So. Okay. He, he divides life up in all these stages, uh, ending at 109. So that's how long you're supposed to live. So he's he's at this point, he's now defining aging. Yeah. He like, is. I'm surprised he's not personally naming every citizen at this point. <laughs> he's, he's pretty, pretty close A big lion outside. Ooh, I did run into a bummer of a fact that's not related to him, but it's related to culture in Turkmenistan. It's one of those places where like people don't want to have too many girls because there's no, a lot of social no. cachet and having too many boys. And so one of the most common names for girls is literally the word enough jesus <laughs> like it's if you've had too many girls you right. name your girl enough or like there's another one that like translates to like please god stop uh, why even yeah it's pretty fucked up that is fucked up because it's like you know is that like they're setting a reminder mm-hmm. like okay this is the last one they're telling god like we're done we have right. enough girls jeez uh, yeah Ugh. yeah 
Ugh. <laughs> yeah. But that one that one's not on Turkmen Bashi. I think yeah. that's just some uh culture needs to wake up a little bit on women's issues, maybe. That's just a, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> People yeah. are terrible. People are terrible and have been forever and are everywhere. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Now, on the twenty fifth of November, two thousand two, attackers in three vehicles ambushed President Niazov's motorcade, firing on it with machine guns. Several of his guards were wounded as they fought off the attack. President Niazov, inside his armored vehicle, reportedly did not notice he had been attacked until he arrived at the office later that day. Oh, I'm glad. I'm glad he's all right. <laughs> you glad he, you were worried? I could yeah, see. I was yeah. worried a little bit. In the immediate wake of the attack, Turkmen Bashi declared that the shooters were quote hired, given weapons, and sent to carry out the shooting. They got high and tried to carry out their orders. Punishment will be brought to them, but they are not the ones who bear the main responsibility. You want to guess who bears the main responsibility? Is it that guy? It's that guy and a bunch of Turkmen dissidents who all lived in foreign countries. Okay. None of none he, of whom lived in the country. I mean, this is smart. He thought of it. It's a good opportunity to pin the blame. Well, and it may not have actually happened. Oh, okay. I mean, it, the shooting itself I mean, happened. But oh, okay. Like, <laughs> he, he didn't notice, apparently, so yeah. it didn't happen for him. Yeah, yeah. And he declared Boris Shikmuradov to be behind it all. But Radio Free Europe, which is... Just so there's is a U.S. government funded organization that reports from inside non democratic countries with no press freedom, but it is a government funded country. So it's one of those things where like they're definitely towing the U.S. government line, but they're also often have good sources inside countries like Turkmenistan. But take it with a grain of okay. whatever you take a U.S. government funded journalism institute right. has. You know. Uh, anyway, Radio Free Europe uh, talked to all of the accused dissidents and also to several other sources in the country, and they posited a counter theory about what happened. Quote, the former deputy prime minister and national bank head denied any role in the attack and said the assassination attempt, which allegedly took place as Niazov was being driven to work, seemed strange. Niazov has two vehicles, a Mercedes and a Jeep. Both have double plate armor. These vehicles cannot be destroyed by machine guns or even rocket propelled grenades. Think for a minute. The alleged attackers let Niazov go by, then they blocked the road in front of the police following Niazov. If the plan had worked, it wouldn't have been for eliminating Niazov. So basically, the allegation is that he faked an assassination it's attempt. A false flag. A it's false an flag. Inside job. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which, yeah, maybe. Right. I mean, <laughs> he's, he's, he's saw nine eleven. He was like, well, that's a false. Flag. Yeah, that's an inside exactly. Job. And we all know that nine eleven was an inside exactly. job. Exactly. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Because jet fuel cannot melt steel beams. No, it can't melt anything. It can't really. melt. It's just jet fuel. Mm-hmm. Like it. That's why I, I use it for hair pomade. Oh yeah, uh, you can drink it. You can drink it. Yeah. Oh man, yeah. That's what most doctors say. A pint of jet fuel a day keeps your insides from becoming steel beams. I mean, it. You certainly won't have any other worries medically <laughs> after that. After drinking your daily pint of yeah, jet fuel, your your problems are all set after that. <laughs> So if Niazov's goal was to use the assassination attempt as an excuse to crush the tiny amount of resistance uh, that remained in his own country, it worked. Shikmuradov turned himself in to stop his family from being horribly tortured, or at least horribly tortured any more than they'd already been horribly tortured. Uh, a few days later, he showed up on state TV, clearly drugged, and admitted to attempting to orchestrate a coup. He thanked Niazov for the mercy that he'd shown in not executing them all, and also thanked the great leader for his compassionate spiritual guidance. That's a real bummer. That's a real bummer. <laughs> That's you're watching that on TV. Like, I think we got to get out of this country. I think we might need to leave this country. Yeah. <laughs> he told State News, "Quote: Among us, us being the conspirators, is not one normal person. We are all nobodies. I am not a person capable of running a country. I am a criminal, only able to destroy it." <sighs> yeah, it's one of those things. I don't. Really this know. is like it's it's the third act, the, like yeah. the dark moment before the hero. Is able to like beat the dystopian leader, and I, mm. I, yeah, I feel like that's not gonna be the thing that happens. <sighs> that's only a thing that happens in movies. I know, <laughs> yeah. but it, it's just so overtly evil. Of yeah, a moment it is, and like Shikmuradov, it's one of those things to raise to that position in the government of Turkmenistan. He's probably pretty corrupt himself. But he also seems to have been a legitimately right. courageous guy, and like obviously this dude needed to be like I don't I don't know if he would have been good or not if like the dictator had been replaced. But I mean, generally, uh, yeah, generally speaking, if they're like let me take over, it's probably yeah. not. It's probably not gonna. It's just be the cycle beginning again with a new face. That is what the odds say. Yeah, uh, but yeah, I mean, he also did turn himself in to save his family, so maybe he was a decent person. Yeah, it's hard I to mean, say. Yeah. That's. That's not an easy choice. I guess not. Because you know you're getting tortured. Yeah, but if if you like your family, if you don't like your family, then it's like fuck him. Yeah, um, he's not but, a total sociopath. Yeah, because a total yeah, sociopath yeah. would not have turned himself in. Yes. Yeah. So 
I don't know. I don't know. Shigmuridov, uh, sorry that you got sentenced to prison for the rest of your life. Mm -hmm. Uh, On TV, Niazov explained that he had shown mercy to all of the conspirators because only Allah decides death. Wow. I'm surprised he hasn't taken that up, too, that he can decide death. Yeah, because he, he's a saying he's, he's deciding a lot of things. And he did he did have a lot of people executed. Okay. Yeah, he did have a lot of people executed. Okay, so he's just a liar. He's, he's, he's definitely a liar. <laughs> yeah, okay. Uh, now, uh, next, Niazov clamped down on civil liberties even more. He ordered the secret police to monitor public conversations. He also asked citizens to report anti-national talk. Being Turkmenbashi, he also did something insane and banned anyone in the country from listening to the radio while driving in their car. <sighs> His reasoning was that the noise would obscure subversive conversations from the eyes of hidden police. It really seems like <laughs> these are moments in his life where he's like being driven around and hears the radio and it's distracting. And he's like, you know what? No more radio. No for more anybody. radio for anybody. Yeah. Fuck the radio. Yeah. I hate the radio now. <laughs> Put it on the list. Yeah. Ballet, radio, Ballet, radio, smoking. movie theaters. Yep. Make sure that puppet theater is still running. <laughs> Who are the people running the puppet theater? Oh, I want to know about them. I bet they really need a cigarette. Yes. <laughs> or they were like, they're probably very passionate about puppets, and then he declared them. They're like, now's the time. <laughs> Yeah, there's just one puppet loving man who was yeah. like, "This is the country I was born to be." Oh in. Yeah. yeah, and they exist. There are puppet loving people. There are puppet lo- Matt Stone and Trey Parker. Yeah, I had a Might I had have a, been really successful here. I had a neighbor who kept asking me to come over and watch a puppet show. And That's like, unsettling. Yeah, I was like that 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 I know you're I gonna know. get murdered. It was I was living in this terrible apartment, and this our weird neighbor was like, "Look, I do puppet shows every week. If you guys want to come," and it was just like. No. <laughs> no. I don't want to die. I'm young. I feel like the word no enters your mind as soon as the word puppet show enters your yeah. ears. <laughs> I did have one roommate go, and I was like, how was it? He was like, it was weird. <laughs> <laughs> it's what it's what it sounds like. It's what it sounds like. Yeah. Our neighbor's puppet show. Yeah. Speaking of puppet shows, I don't... I'm at the edge of my seat here. <laughs> <laughs> you know what isn't a puppet? Busy Bone Dog Treats, mm. the only dog treats currently sitting on this table. Yeah. Yep. They look good. You could probably eat them. I felt like this was the time for an ad plug. Uh, I also feel like the the bones on the front of that kind of look like tampons. There's even a string coming out of one of them. Oh, good God. They they really do. They're teaching the dog. Why, why is there a string coming out of that? <laughs> okay, it is an arrow. Okay. All right. That was an unnecessary digression. <laughs> Speaking of unnecessary digressions. Actually, speaking of necessary, I was about to say it's pretty necessary. You know what's necessary? Hey, and we're back. Hey, okay. So, uh, when we last left off, Niazov had just banned the radio. Uh, Sure. (laughs) I mean, not the weirdest thing he's banned. Not the weirdest thing he's banned. Yeah. The next and last period of Niazov's life was a golden age for baddie-ass laws. He required universities to test all applicants on their knowledge of his dumb book, the Runama. He reorganized the justice system so that prisoners could only be released when they'd sworn an oath upon his book. In 2004, he demanded that the Runama should be used in mosques alongside the Quran. I'm not one for burning books, for obvious (laughs) reasons. But the Runama, maybe. Yeah, but it feels like we need to get rid of this book. I also... I. I'm going to guess it's probably pretty clear to the listeners, but in case you haven't had a lot of experience with, like, Muslims and Islam, I can't imagine anything more blasphemous than what this guy's done. Oh, like, yeah. Like, that's pretty hardcore blasphemy. Yeah. <laughs> like, now, the National Mufti, the, like, Islamic religious leader for the nation of Turkmenistan, objected uh, to this random dude's book being made a requirement huh. alongside the Holy Book of the Faith. Uh, he was instantly arrested and declared to be a part of the coup two years ago. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. 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 That sounds about right. <laughs> Retroactively. <laughs> Retroactively. Part of a coup. Responsible for the coup. Now, during a tour of small villages that same year, 2004, Niazov was allegedly angered that none of the local libraries had enough people in them. He ordered all rural libraries across the country shut down. This may have been due to the fact that Turkmen Bashi described all writers who were not himself. He considered it a personal insult that anyone would want to read any book besides the Runama. Sure, yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. That, yeah, it fits. Yep. Uh, also in 2004, oh. he declared July 10th a melon holiday. 
and April 27th, Horse Day. Nice. Yeah, we got a horse day horse in there. Horse day. Yeah. He banned beards uh, because he was worried. <laughs> <laughs> sure. 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 He was worried about Islamic fundamentalists hiding amongst the populace. Uh, I think he saw a guy eating soup and he was like, uh, <laughs> uh, No, I don't want no that No more happening. beards. So his tired assistant's like, yeah, I got it. No yeah. more beards. No more beards. All right, we'll put it out. <sighs> Uh, he banned circuses. Uh, <laughs> huh. Hold on. Hold on. You can't be pro-puppet show and anti-circus. anti-circus. Especially being pro-horse and anti-circus. Yeah. Well, I, I sort of get that. If you see a circus, you're like, oh, God, those poor horses. Okay, that actually might make a little yeah. bit of sense. But like puppet shows and circuses, it's all in the same ridiculous spectacle. Like it's 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 all the same circle of like... These are the things that are used for entertainment in hell. Yeah. 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 Like circuses, puppets. Yeah. Now, it, so basically, anytime the president expressed a mild dislike for something, it was essentially banned. Yeah. Now, what he was not passing laws against these things. He wasn't saying it's forbidden to have a beard. He wasn't saying it's forbidden to do this or that. He would go on TV and basically express his dislike for a certain oh. thing, and then everybody would have to stop doing it because it's a police state. Right. So, like, that's the way this works. Uh, and a good example of how it proceeded was Turkmen Bashi's hatred of gold teeth fillings. Aww. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, he denounced them in a speech, saying, quote, I watched young dogs when I was young. They were given bones to gnaw. Those of you whose teeth have fallen out did not gnaw on bones. This is my advice. What? <laughs> gnaw on bones. <laughs> Take out your gold teeth. Wait, wait. Yeah. He didn't like gold teeth. He like expressed that he didn't think they looked good, that natural teeth looked better, and that people should gnaw on bones if they want their teeth to be healthy. Okay, so he's like against just missing teeth in general. No, gold teeth in specific. Okay, so you can lose a tooth and you can get like a... Like a replacement that looks like a normal tooth, but not oh, gold. okay, but yeah. not gold. Yeah. So here's how a Telegraph article that interviewed several people in the country who had to get their teeth replaced uh, described what happened next. Quote, in Turkmenistan, a Niazov lifestyle tip is as good as law. In a Pavlovian response to his remarks, which were broadcast repeatedly on television, people rushed to swap their gold teeth for porcelain. Miss Tolivia, a 32-year-old laboratory technician, had been sent home from work because of her offending teeth, as universities, <laughs> government departments, and state-run companies humored their president for life. I have had gold teeth since I was 18, Miss Tolivia said. It was my dowry from my parents when I got married. Before, I was really proud of my teeth. They showed me as a success, but now I cannot work and have them. As her husband hovered protectively, each crown, bloodied and flecked with pieces of tissue, was carefully saved to be melted down later by a jeweler. The couple, he confided, were not quite sure what to do. Perhaps we have enough for a ring, he pondered, or maybe earrings. Until he bans those. Until he bans earrings and rings, yeah. I love that they call it lifestyle tips. Yeah. Like, this is goop. Like, yeah. it's Gwyneth Paltrow as a dictator. It is kind of Gwyneth Paltrow yeah. as a dictator. This guy's like, you know what? Cigarettes are bad for me. Yeah. Nobody gets to smoke. Yeah. <laughs> Cigarettes are out. Cigarettes are out. <laughs> so are gold teeth. Chew on some bones. Uh, if, isn't Gwen a pouch? She's big into the bone broth, right? Probably. Probably. I mean, she yeah. looks like she's big into the bone broth. This is a dictatorship of Gwyneth Paltrow. Yeah. That's exactly what's going on in fucking Turkmenistan right now. Well, we're during you know the early two thousands. Right. Yeah. So when local meteorologists were incorrect about a forecast, uh, Niazov fired the head of the meteorology department and also banned TV reporters from wearing makeup, quote, because it masked their natural weedish color, making them look white and masked the difference between the appearances of men and women. It really is just every every little thing that bugs him. He's just always on TV. He has opinions about everything and everyone's scared to like they're not laws, but everyone's scared to not to do something the president doesn't like. But at this point, it's it's almost like, it's almost like he has a like a show, and he's just trying to fill time. So he's like, yeah. "All right, what do I what do I not like? What, what um, am I pissed about today? His makeup, makeup, on, like yeah, no, don't wear like makeup he, anymore. Yeah, I don't even think he's that passionate about this yeah. stuff at this point. <laughs> he's just trying to make content. Yeah, yeah. Turkmen Bashi's commands generally came during TV interviews. He would say something, express an opinion, and suddenly it was the way things were. In one interview, he ordered the education ministry to watch the hairstyles of students. Young men should not be allowed to wear, have long hair, in addition to the beard ban. All goatees also had to go. Which is the first time I'm on, you know what? All right. Yeah. Yeah, let's get rid of those. I mean, yeah, I'm getting to that age where if I look at college students, I'm just like, Ch- uh, change all that. Change all of that stuff. <laughs> get rid of all of it. You know, when I think about what situations might justify the deployment of like a fire hose against people, mm-hmm. it's 
every time I've walked past a frat house. Sure. Just just hose them out. Yeah. Em- empty that building. Oh yeah. With pressurized water. Yeah, like because yeah. Yeah. You just need to clean it. <laughs> you just need to clean yeah. it and the people it's, inside it. Yeah, it's that or if people are on fire. That's it. Yep, those are the only two circumstances, yeah. frat houses or burning to death. Yeah. Uh, now, as a cost-cutting measure, Niazov fired 15,000 healthcare workers and replaced them with untrained military recruits, uh. figuring that what worked for traffic police would work just as well for nurses and EMTs. <laughs> now, did it work for traffic police? <laughs> no. <laughs> of course not. <laughs> what are the EMTs going to do? <laughs> Whatever untrained 19-year-olds know how to do. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> Who would think that? He's old enough to know. Like, it, it, well, he you goes to a to German be... doctor. He doesn't go to doctors in Turkmenistan. <laughs> oh yeah. <it's... laughs> he also closed down all of the hospitals outside of the capital, uh, saying that anybody who, who had a hospital? medical emergency could just come to the capital. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's fair. That's fair. That's fair. Yeah. In 2005, Niazov opened a gigantic horse track near the capital, the largest in Asia, uh, because he'd gotten really into horses. Solid. <laughs> Solid. <laughs> that Telegraph reporter was in town during the opening of the racetrack, and his description of it is quite a lot of fun. The attention to detail is remarkable. Along the approach road, teenage conscript soldiers in khaki boiler suits robotically place whitewashed stones in small circles around the trunks of newly planted fir trees. At the center, there are swimming pools, therapy centers, and state-of-the-art veterinary facilities for the animals. In Ardag, the president's stallion is almost as prominent in Turkmenistan as his patron. Niazov is busy cultivating the myth that he is reviving an ancient breed of horse. The Akhal Teke is his personal claim to restoring national greatness. In fact, to criticize the money lavished on the Akhal Teke horses is to commit the offense of parricide, defined in the National Criminal Code as questioning the policy of the president. Wow. So, don't get angry at his horses or you'll go to prison. Mm. I bet Gwyneth Paltrow likes horses, too. I bet she would do all of the things he's done. So, key to a great nation, uh, statues and horses. What else could it be, Dave? Yeah, that's fair. Yeah. In addition to building a palatial racetrack, Turkmenbashi ordered hundreds of homes bulldozed in the capital so he could build a series of massive white marble apartment buildings he designed himself. The buildings were never occupied because no one in the city could afford them. The owners of the homes previously on the land were, again, not compensated for their loss. Yeah. Yeah. No. Turkmenbashi declared himself a landscape artist next and promised to create a forest in the desert that would last a thousand years and improve Turkmenistan's brutal climate. To achieve this goal, he planted a massive cypress forest around a fake lake he had built in the desert. How'd that go? Well, Paul Thoreau visited shortly after the forest was planted, and he observed that, quote, Although Bashi's trees, mostly a type of juniper, were two or three feet high when planted, the forestation was not a success. Drip irrigation had been rigged for them, but they were baked by the sun and blown flat by the wind. A full third had that peculiar rust-red hue, the vivid color of an evergreen's death. (laughs) He's just, man... You can't. He's spinning out of control at this point. <laughs> He's just really trying He's everything. Like, I'm going to make a forest. I'm going to make a forest now, motherfuckers. <laughs> He's great. <laughs> Next, he built an ice palace outside the capital uh, city. <laughs> is it in the desert? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so at this point, he's just like, fuck reality. <laughs> yeah, what a nice palace. Yeah. He built a 130-foot-tall pyramid. He built the largest mosque in Asia, which he named the Spirit of Turkmenbashi himself. <sighs> A lot of stuff, by the way, I feel like are things that Nicolas Cage has done as well. Yeah. Like, I feel like the Venn diagram, like, there's a large crossover between the two. I feel like if Nicolas Cage built a mosque, it would be less blasphemous than this. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Like, he would show more respect for the religion. (laughs) And, of course, this gigantic mosque was, again, festooned with quotes from the Quran and Mm -hmm. from Turkmen Bashi's equally important book, The Ruknama. Uh, Turkmen Bashi insisted that Turkmen visit the mosque as a regional equivalent to the Hajj which is, you know, the the Muslim requirement to go to Mecca if you possibly can. So, okay. Yeah. Yeah, he just he's putting himself right on that level. Yeah. Yeah. This is also around the time when he declared himself a prophet of God. So Oh man. Yeah. Wait, he hadn't done that yet? Not officially. Okay. Yeah, you got to make sure everybody knows, you know, he he had written a book declaring himself God's son, but you got to make it clear, you know. Right. That you're a prophet of God. In 2006, when New Yorker writer Paul Thoreau visited Turkmenistan, the people of the country had just spontaneously declared their leader the national prophet. So sorry, that's how it went. Okay. I mixed up my notes there for a second. So in 2006, the Turkmenistan people declared their leader the national prophet. Did they, though? Yeah, I mean, of course they did, Dave. Like, the, 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 They love him. The, they the, love him. The president for life of Turkmenistan would not lie about the people of Turkmenistan declaring him the national okay. prophet. Yeah. 
Now, in Paul Thoreau's trip through the country, he saw portraits of the leader everywhere. Quote, several of them measuring hundreds of square feet, everywhere in Ashgabat. In some, he looked like a fat and grinning Dean Martin. In others, he was the truculent CEO with a chilly smile. A common image showed him, chin on hand, squinting an insincere bonhomie, like a lounge singer. A heavy drinker, a bully, and a wearer of bling, two or three diamond rings on each hand. He had Italianate features and was sometimes portrayed with a stack of books, like an author on a book tour. Jeez. Yeah. I just realized, I don't know what this guy looks like. Oh, yeah. We got to pull up a Turkmen Bashi picture for you. We'll, yeah. we'll throw one up on the site, too. Now, as he aged, Turkmen Bashi became increasingly insistent on demanding that his people smile at all times. <sighs> He's that guy. <laughs> he is huh? that guy. <laughs> oh, yeah. Here's his picture. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's that looks about right. Yeah, that looks about right. It looks like a big old, big old baby. Big old baby big face. Big old baby. Baby face Turkmen Bashi. Yeah. Uh, in the Runama, he had written, quote, A smile can make a friend for you out of an enemy. And when death stares you in the face, smile at it, and it may leave you untouched. How is that not the thing that incites a revolution? <laughs> like, hey, guys, smile more. I'd be like, all right, we're done here. <laughs> I was okay with the puppets, <laughs> yeah. but I'm ready to die now. <laughs> Over the years, uh, Turkmenbashi continued to drive home his point about smiling, telling his people to talk to each other with smiles and promising there will never be any wrinkles on a smiling face. He claimed his love of smiles had been inspired by his sainted mother. Her smile is visible to me in the dark of night, even if I have my eyes shut. So that's sweet. Yeah, real sweet. He renamed Ketchup. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> He declared, he's, well, because the word ketchup's a foreign term, and he, he believed it deserved a real Turkmen name. Okay, but it's not the only thing named with a foreign term. <laughs> <laughs> he was getting around to all of them, but ketchup was a priority. Gotta start a ketchup. Gotta start a Everybody ketchup. Everybody loves ketchup. <laughs> he really loved renaming things. Mm. What did he rename ketchup to? Oh, I, just a, a, a Turkmen word. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't catch that. Okay, I, hope uh, it, I wish it was his name, <laughs> Turkmen Bashi. Yeah. <laughs> oh dear God. He also required that doctors uh, swear an oath now on the Runama rather than the Hippocratic oath. Sure, I'm yeah. surprised that didn't already happen. Yeah, 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 yeah. I think I may have gotten my times a little bit mixed up on that one. That might have happened when he closed down most of the hospitals. Oh, okay. Yeah. Sorry. There's a lot of crazy things to to keep track of in order here. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Oof. Uh, and they're not it's not consistently crazy it's 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 this this beautiful potpourri it's yeah like puppet shows and ketchup and uh, like oh man and you, then like not... false flag attacks that oppress dissidents and right like really smart policies of neutrality and renaming ketchup right <laughs> yeah yeah like some of the stuff it's like oh yeah he's doing the classic hits of a dictator yeah. and then he's throwing in these crazy ones yeah because you can imagine Stalin doing some of this, but he would never have bothered to rename ketchup. Right. He's, no, fuck it. It's fine. Maybe eventually. <laughs> maybe, like, maybe eventually. Oh, okay. What do I get Linen that? sauce. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> In 2006, uh, Turkmen Bashi had constructed the Turkmen Bashi Eternally Great Park. Nice. Uh, yeah. <laughs> it was an enormous wooded park with a concrete path up a mountain, built by Turkmen Bashi as part of an effort to urge his people to be healthier and exercise more often. Mm. In 2006, Niazov declared the first Saturday in November to be Health Day. He demanded that all of his ministers partake in a five-mile walk, starting at Turkmenbashi Eternally Great Park and going all the way up to the top of the mountain. Oh, now you're making them walk. Yep. Turkmenbashi himself did not walk. He had a helicopter fly him to the top of the mountain where he'd had a helipad installed. He made fun of anyone who took more than two hours to make the walk. That is Perfect. Yeah. <laughs> Classic Turkmen Bashi. Uh, uh, yeah, at this point, he's just like, I wonder what more I can get away yeah, with. What more can I get? That turned out to be the last thing he could get away with. Because okay. on December 31st, 2006, <laughs> Supramarat Niazov, great leader of the Turkmen's, God's prophet on earth, died of heart failure. Good. Good. <laughs> <laughs> Here's how the book in, for him. Insights. It was a wise yeah, choice. It was a good, really the thing I've agreed with the most that he's done mm-hmm. is yeah. dying of heart failure. Uh, here's how the book Inside Central Asia sums up his legacy. The Turkmen despot left behind a republic where the average monthly income was $60. Yet most people managed to get by on generous state subsidies for housing and basic foods, free electricity, water, and gas. We are not free, but we are not hungry, an unnamed Turkmen told visiting New York Times correspondent C.J. Chivers, who noted that food was inexpensive, gasoline sold for four cents per gallon, and bazaars were filled with Chinese goods. 
And that is about the best that anyone can say for Turkmenbashi, the lunatic president of Turkmenistan. He was a brutal monster and a nut, but food and gas were cheap, so nobody murdered him. Yeah, I mean, it really does kind of come down to that. It comes down to that, I know I said it earlier, but I feel like a lot of this is like, so we got to call ketchup something Mm -hmm. else, but gas is still cheap. Mm Mm-hmm. Um, four cent. I feel like people here would put up with a lot for four yes. cent a gallon gas. I've been, I've been saying this a lot. Yeah, is that if we got like red dawned mm-hmm. um, when they'd land, I'd be like, so what do you have to offer? So yeah, what, <laughs> what, what's y'all's plan? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> things are not going great here right yeah. now. What's the what's the? <laughs> if it's not good, I'll be like, okay, go Wolverines. But yeah, like. Yeah. Yeah, first of all, I'd, see, I'd hear the pitch. I'd hear yeah. the pitch. And even if I went Wolverines, I'd probably take advantage of the free health care first. Oh, yeah. I haven't been to a doctor in a while. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah yes. I am falling apart. Oh, yeah, it's a disaster. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, he was replaced by a dentist, by the way. Okay. Yep. Okay. Yep. The dentist banned cigarettes and had all of the cigarettes in the country incinerated. Wow. Yep. So, seems like things are... Continuing right on that path. What's his view on gold teeth? <laughs> that, now that I'm not aware of. Yeah, I want to know. That's another episode. Yeah. The dentist president who came next. <laughs> so it's not going great for them still. Oh, again, gas prices are great. Gas is, yeah, I think gas is still pretty cheap. So yeah. it's not nothing. <laughs> I mean, yeah. I mean, he killed people, bulldozed homes. <laughs> bulldozed homes. Oh, man. Banned ballet in the radio. Oh. What a weird maniac. What a weird maniac. Yeah. To have so a country. Oddly specific. Very oddly specific. Like uh, I'd love to talk to the people who lived who live there because yeah. they you can, you have to be confused by that shit, right? There's a great passage in that Paul Thoreau New York New Yorker article where like he recites a conversation that his driver and his interpreter had where they were trying to figure out what the days of the week were. <laughs> and they were both natives. Like they right. were. Like, no, no, no. This is what he renamed the day to. And then like, no, I think it was this. And it was like the, it clearly took time for everyone to figure out. Right. They, like, <laughs> Maybe it was a performance art piece. The whole thing about how arbitrary like dictatorships are. Because it's that where it's like I, I guess it's it's renaming the weeks. It's like it's I, a it's as worthwhile as anything else we do. I guess I did check, and the timing did not work out for him to have been Andy Kaufman. Oh, okay. I was kind of, I was suspicious of that. One of these days, he'll, yeah. one of them will be Andy Kaufman. Mm-hmm. It'll work out. Dave. I'm Pluggables. Dave. Um, no, oh, geez. I, I mentioned my Patreon, patreon.com slash Gamefully Unemployed. We do a uh, podcast. We do streaming. I also want to give a shout out to uh, Some More News, which I write episodes of. Oh, yeah, yeah. Give money to Some More News yeah. to Gamefully Unemployed. <laughs> Uh, which is Cody's, mm-hmm. Cody's Shody. Uh, uh, neither of them out. will ban golden teeth. Yeah, that's true. I also write for bunnyears.com. Check that out. Macaulay Culkin might Mac- ban golden teeth. Oh, he already has. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, he's, he's a monster. <laughs> he's, 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 he's the Turkman Bashi of uh-huh, internet comedy. Uh-huh. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this has been Behind the Bastards. Uh, you can find us on the internet at behindthebastards.com. You can find us on Twitter and Instagram at, at @bastardspod. You can find my book on Amazon.com, A Brief History of Vice. It's, I hurt my friends with drugs. He poisoned me. I poisoned Dave with drugs <laughs> uh, very irresponsibly. It was great. When I say I am the opposite of a doctor, I mean it. Uh, I am the opposite of a doctor. Yeah, it's still fun to get medical advice from you, though. <laughs> oh, man. Oh, yeah. I've yeah. got... Uh, hit hit me up on Twitter at IWriteOK and ask me medical advice. Uh, I will give you medical advice. Um, legally binding medical advice. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Well, that's been the podcast. Uh, buy a shirt. T Public Behind the Bastards. Uh, we've got the new Raul Wallenberg shirts. Uh, save lives. Do crimes. I love about 40% of you. <laughs>